historically highly cited within uh, humanistic management and are kind of early um, in the development of, of that thought. And so I've got them both up. Uh, one of them we talked a little bit about last month, uh, Benedetta Giovanola on rethinking the anthropological and ethical foundation of economics and business. And then the other one is by Dominic Mele and the firm as a community of persons. What I'd like to do is actually go into that second one uh, at the beginning because it's new. We'll give it the bulk of the time. We'll loop back around to Benedetta. And then for any of you who were with us last time, both of these use a lot of references to Aristotle's ethics, his idea of the human good, of human flourishing or eudaimonia. And so any connections you see there will be great. Um, with that, uh, now I know that we're all busy. We all have come with different levels of kind of background knowledge as well as different levels of preparation uh, in terms of the reading materials. So uh, I'm just going to kind of dive in with a few uh, beginning questions about this uh, first article and then uh, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. Feel free to set, uh, put comments here in the chat session or things that you'd like to bring up. Um, I think it works best if we try to um, stay on mute when we're not actually contributing, but we're going for that conversational element. So if you have something to say, come off, try to break in. Uh, that's much appreciated. So to start with, right, um, right here in the first paragraph, first of all, can people see what I'm sharing? Is it still, is it still shared? It's still it's shared. shared. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Um, so that this is the uh, beginning paragraph of Dominic's article, and he talks about this idea of a business ethos, and I think that's that's worth kind of considering here. So um, let me highlight the, the central part here: um, the business ethos underlying any particular way of understanding business, and. Um, he is going to then say there are multiple ones and he wants to advocate for a particular new one. But let's just pause here and, and kind of stand back and reflect. Are there ways of understanding business? Is that something that we normally critically reflect on? Um, do you have a way, do you understand business? Anybody here want to kind of, um, explain how you see business as a as a researcher what do you think it is maybe we can start with just raising of hands um, how many people off the top of your head can can think of at least two different ways of thinking about business I mean, I can because I've been reading about humanistic management. I think we will see in some of these articles that there are a sort of rational choice theory and stakeholder theory, but some of us may not have considered that before. And I like um, that. Yeah, good. That's great. So we can lower hands now. I like that Mele or Dominic has, has asked just that question right at the beginning, getting us to reconsider our um, our framework, our, our starting point for, for understanding this. So um, he's going to then try to give us two pillars of that. So um, let me just kind of find where he actually says <clears throat> that. Tyson, are you trying to share it? Because it, uh, it's still stuck on the first slide. Um... What are you seeing? Are you seeing the slide? We're just seeing the slide, we're not seeing- Oh, I was trying uh, to share the article. Let me come back to the article. Right. Is that the article now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. All right, so let me, and then if I highlight it, do we see something highlighted? Okay, great. Right, well then in that case, um, I'm going to scroll to the next page. So we're at the top first full paragraph on page 90. Um, you know, he, he's kind of giving us the, um, 
alternative view first, right? So he says the, the theory, the, the view of business that he's critiquing is rational, self-interested, utility maximizing. It's a little bit what you were talking about, Victoria, the, the concept of the homo economicus um, and the articles that Klaus Dierksmeier has written and uh, as well as, as Michael here, who has collaborated with Klaus in a few things. Um, what, is, what is Mele offering instead? That's kind of coming here in the, in the next. What are the, uh, in the next paragraph, what are the two pillars, he says, that we need to reconsider in terms of it's maybe not rational, it's maybe not utility maximizing. How do we how do we need to look at that? It's got two dimensions, right? Anybody want to jump in? And maybe another way of thinking about it is what what are you used to seeing? How how is business organization usually thought of? What is the normal business model that with the old economistic assumptions that we're used to that Dominic is actually trying to refute and build upon here? Yeah. And I think it's the, you know, he's using the language of pillars here in the second paragraph that I'm highlighting here. It's the domains that need to be explained or, or even just assumed when we, when we think about business, right? So one of them is the view of the firm. And the other one is the view of the individual actor in an economic system. Right. So uh, those two ones are ones he's going to question. Obviously, we know from the title that he's interested in the view of the firm here. Um, okay, great. So then um, jumping down here to the, the kind of the section beginning on the bottom of the page. Um, first of all, um, he's going to refer to the view of the firm as a nexus of contracts. And this should have come up for some of us before. Uh, who is familiar, again, let's use hands, with the view of the firm as contracts? Yes, good. I like that we're using video. We might as well use that rather mm -hmm. than uh, the digital hand. Um, anybody want to give a quick, like, what does that mean? What do we mean by the view of the firm as a nexus of contracts? Somebody's jumped on. Can't actually see who that is. Yon Yon, you've come off mute. Did I say that correctly? Maybe that wasn't intentional. Yeah, from the group, what, what do you think uh, the author here means by the firm being a nexus of contracts? Stanley, when I think you can just start speaking, we have a small enough group. Am, am I unmuted? Um, You're unmuted. Now uh, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, all right, this is Celeste. I mean, I, my assumption, uh, just off the, I mean, when we talk about nexus of contracts, I mean, my, my first thought, of course, is just, you know, the transaction cost and, and agency views of, of management, kind of the, the traditional self-interested, rational uh, approach to what we think of as, as uh, human motivation. Yeah, absolutely, Celeste. That's right. And, and here, um, he's citing exactly what you said, right? He's citing Ronald Coase, Transaction Cost Economics. He's got Jensen in here, uh, agency theory. But um, what does transaction costs say that the firm does? Like, why do we have firms versus um, not firms? Um, I, my, I mean, my feel free anyone else to kind of step in here because this is I'm certainly no expert, but my understanding about about that view of the firm is that uh, you know the purpose is to make the process of trade uh, more efficient, so that you, you know these uh, these this nexus of contracts uh, more efficient it. it um, creates efficiency because we are, you know, we're doing what we're good at and we're holding others accountable to do what, what they are good at. 
Um, and so it is a very kind of transactional, rational approach to, to relationships. Right. But also efficiency. No, exactly. I totally agree, Celeste. Especially the, the idea that what we're trying to do is be efficient in production. Right? So, so, you know, is Coase is asking if, if markets are, are so efficient at, at organizing, allocating resources, why do we need firms to do some organizing and allocating as well? It seems like we could just have markets do all of that. Nowhere is he asking, what else do firms do besides organizing and allocating resources? He's simply interested in, in those two activities. And he eventually kind of says, well, they must do certain types of that more efficiently than the market does. And so our whole point of having a firm then is to organize and allocate resources efficiently when that's more efficient to do inside of a firm. Um, you know, when we then add that to agency theory, so um, I think, um, I can't, who, who's heard of agency theory? Victoria, did you raise your hand for that one as well? Oh no, I've got another hand up there. Um, was that David? Greenway? Oh, I can't hear you, David. Oh, you're Hold talking. On. There we go. There we go. Am I there? Yeah, there we go. So da David, what's agency theory? Oh, you were going to ask me that. I shouldn't have said yes. Um, well, essentially, it's the agency theory is again the, the 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 cost of getting people to do what you need them to do. Essentially, right? I mean, it's um, the, it's the idea of the um, the the manager or the agent, um, you know, work, work again working for the organization to to be able to get things done the way they need to be done. So, I mean, that's that's probably an oversimplistic view of it. No, my well on that one, or did I miss that? Yeah, well said. Anybody want to add to that? So, yeah. I think um, both of those are 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 the essential thing that that Mele is going for, right? Post transaction cost economics is about utility and efficiency. Agency theory comes in and says, well, there are owners owners of the firm and they want something and they have to pay managers to get what they want. So both of these are viewing um, the firm as something that is serving some person's individual interests. And that's, in this section, I would argue that's kind of the key criticism is that all we're dealing with is a vehicle for accomplishing my personal interest or the owner's personal interest somebody's interest and Melee's question is could a firm be for more than that right? could a firm exist because of some other reason than satisfying my interest or something that i want to contract for right? which i think it's it's well written but is that a controversial idea how many of us think a firm might exist for more reasons than just to satisfy somebody's economic interests. I do. Yes, right. This is something that we're more sympathetic to now than maybe we were in the past, but it's worth understanding the arguments for why. David, were you going to add something to that? Well, just that, uh, yeah, agency theory really, I think it's part of, I have an economics degree and, you know, growing up with the management theories, you realize that, uh, what they're teaching you is that the firm, the model of the firm, the way we view the firm, really managed around the agents of the organization, uh, the managers, serving the interests of the owners of the company, but only the owners. So it doesn't really look at the firm as this nexus of contract with other, uh, other different stakeholders. Now, stakeholder theory from Friedman got us a step closer, saying the firm should be re-envisioned to to look at all stakeholder relationships and their interactions with one another. But I think what uh, Dominic's doing in this article is something even beyond that. So mm -hmm. what, uh, to the group, I mean, what value do you see looking at the firm differently, not just for the management of the owner's capital and profit, but for actually the people that are associated with the firm? 
Is there any value to that from your perspectives? <laughs> Um, David, could you, um, when you say uh, that Dominic goes beyond um, a stakeholder theory, it, can you can you say just a little bit more about that? Well, I think, and this is my interpretation, and I, I welcome anyone to give me their thoughts on what you think Melly is saying in the article, but uh, it's it's more about the relationships that exist within the organization. So being a community assumes a real interactive relational level and perspective that uh, stakeholder theory touches upon saying that stakeholder networks are important for the management of the firm, but really from the firm's perspective, there's, I think, a more of a normative message here with Nelly. Yeah, I, that's right where I thought we'd go next, actually, because right here at the top of page um, 91, uh, and, it's, and it's rare in these circles to get a criticism or a constructive feedback on stakeholder theory, because uh, Ed, Ed Freeman is published in um, H&J and things like that, but, but um, here he does. So Dominic, at the top, like I said, of 91 here on the left-hand side, uh, he says, um, although stakeholder interest screw goes beyond the idea that the firm is a mere nexus of contracts, it maintains the idea that the firm is an abstract and fictitious entity, not a real entity. And then um, jumping down here, the interests of all stakeholders have intrinsic value. So it's basically uh, his criticism is maybe less encapsulated in the sentence here. Stakeholder theory brings in more people's interests but we're still talking about economic interest at the end of the day. And so simply, uh, if, you know, if you wanted to say uh, stakeholder theory's contribution is, is taking aim or debunking stakeholder primacy, shareholder primacy, saying we have a firm, the traditional view is that the shareholder's interests are at the top and everybody else is scum. Right? Stakeholder view says, well, everybody's interests are important. And then I think Mele, as, as you're saying, uh, is really interested in taking it further to relationships. So here's, uh, you know, I'll pull out a sentence out of the next section. Social contact theory um, suggests that primary relationships are contractual. That's misunderstanding the notion of communities. Uh, you, you know, we, you have so many, how many relationships in your life how many people have relationships in their life that are not contractual, right? Loads, <laughs> lots of relationships that are not. How many people have relationships at work that are not contractual? Again, all of us, I, I hope. Um, so that's where he's going with this. And I, and I think that makes a lot, a lot more sense. Um, he lists off on the right-hand column of 91, all the different sort of, oh yeah, let's add that to our view of the firm that has already been done by economics and business theory. So he's not totally missing criticisms from within the business community. I bet most of us can list some of those ourselves. So were we, it would be unfair to say, oh, down in your um, basic economics class or your um, strategy fundamentals class at your business school, they view the firm as just a nexus of contracts and interests. I think most business school professors at this point have some caveats to that picture they would already add. Um, this, maybe we can use chat for this one. What are some of those, um, what are some of those caveats where we study exceptions to rational choice theory or exceptions to sort of purely uh, greedy views of individuals um, operating in the business world. What, what theories contribute to that critique? And some of them are listed on page 91, so you can look there if you want to and, and see. I'm just gonna type in one that um, I see. Organizational commitments. What else? 
what other views do we see here on this page? I'll scroll up a little bit. Yeah, I think identity. Well, if you don't, yeah, there we go, Michael. That's good. That's an updated one. Citizenship, <laughs> identification, Celeste, well said. Social capital theory. Yeah. Um, trust. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So, and some of you may be uh, away from keyboards. I think somebody was driving. Please don't stop and type when you're driving. Uh, we don't want that. We're happy you're here. <laughs> yeah, great. So, you know, we already have some of these ideas. But we come kind of to Mela's contribution, which is business might be a community. Uh, and then he lists a whole bunch of definitions of community. I think they're all consistent, but um, you know maybe we go to kind of his really heavy-duty theoretical one, which is kind of on the top of page 93. So uh, here he's saying, when I want to theoretically talk about what a business is or any kind of community, what do we mean? A unified body of individuals with common interests or common location or common history and common characteristics or beliefs, but not just those things because you can have those and then it's not a community, they're just sort of co-located. They are interconnected and organized or they have cohesion, right? So it's have commonality, organization, sorry, commonality, interconnectivity, and something that is cohesive about them. I would say those are his three main elements, mostly from the last sentence that I've got highlighted here. Mm -hmm. um, we have any sociologists, any group psychology people in here? That would be nice if we had. Um, Maybe next time we'll get somebody who wants to kind of comment further on those things. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so we're talking about what makes a group a community. And he's got some characteristics here. And then he's going to go on and argue, I won't bore you with all the details here in this literature review, but that management literature occasionally refers to these kinds of things, especially, especially I'll call out um, Burns' transformational leadership. Where's that? Here, that's right where I'm showing transformational leadership. So some of us may have come across that in a kind of our master's mm -hmm. classes. Transformational leadership where you're really engaging your organization with a sense of meaning and purpose, a story of where we've been and where we're going, and a you know, in trying to engender that commitment, that identity. Uh, Celeste, I think, pulled out identity as a theme. That is much more than a nexus of contracts. So again, Mele admits, Managerial literature occasionally talks about firms as something like a community. Uh, theory Z from the, the 1980s, that's another good example of it. Um, then he goes on to talk about business ethics writers. Solomon is somebody that he cites a lot. There's some citations, the, the references here that I'm certainly going to go look up um, after having read this paper. But essentially, these are the references to Aristotle. Like Last time, right? So um, that saying that, well, what did what did we read last time? That um, the the chief uh, is it is it better? Let's see if anybody remembers. Um, is it better, according to Aristotle, to seek the good of an individual person or the good of a city? Hands up for the city. Yes. That's right. So Aristotle's ethics says the good of a collective is more important than the good of an individual person. And basically these authors are citing some of that conversation that we read last time um, and coming up with the same thing. And then lastly, what does he add in? Catholic social teaching. So again, um, quite a bit of attempts by 
in the Catholic community, I would argue many religious communities to deal with the phenomenon of business come back to this. We have some idea of a community of people seeking each other's good of kind of the transcendent good of the whole collective or the whole community. Most people justify business on those kinds of terms. We just don't see that in agency theory as much as we maybe should. So anybody want to add to that kind of lit review? I know it's always important to know where we've come from, but not always accepted. Yes, Michael. Well, I just want to add <clears throat> that one of the proponents of agency theory, Michael Jensen, has sort of undergone some conversion, you could say, mm -hmm. and, uh, and now at least frames it with the uh, integrity um, uh, paradigm. So without, w with full opportunism, nothing works, right? Even though that's the assumption for agency theory. And it may be a smart assumption to just safeguard your community against abuse. So it's not like this is a prescriptive one, it's sort of a, a, a protective one. And they are already sort of moving towards a communal sort of approach in, in different ways, because they know that the workability of such an approach with uh, opportunism and psychopathy, et cetera, doesn't, doesn't work. Mm. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely seems like people come back around to, to these ideas. You know, there's almost a, a life cycle of a scholar. Um, yeah. And uh, certainly, well, this paper references um, Sumatra Ghoshal's uh, bad management theories, you know, pretty bad management practice, uh, 2005, pu published posthumously. So right at the end of his life, uh, he kind of came back with this, you know, when we talk about uh, maximizing profit-seeking individuals, sort of interacting in this um, amoral system, we're creating a monster, we're creating a problem. That's, that's the sum yeah. of that article, although I encourage everyone to read that. Yeah. Okay, so then starting on 94, there's a, the, the core of his philosophical argument, what does it mean to be a community? Um, he's going to reference heavily some of the um, things we read last week and other, other sections in Aristotle. You now I've got up here, man is by nature a political soon, a political animal, so you're not really a human being in this philosophical tradition, unless you are in relationship with a community of other human beings. There are no, there are no individuals. It's kind of the starting, starting point here. Uh, something that should be more familiar to us would be starting to get into these definitions of the good. So I know a few of us were here well, maybe not. Sunitha was with us, but now she's gone. Who all was in, is anybody here who was with us last time? No, maybe not. Well, that's right. Um, I'll, I'll remind us that one of the reasons we were reading a little bit of Aristotle's ethics was his idea of the good. And he has this hierarchical sort of grouping of goods into higher and higher orders. So it basically says you can have a good of teaching in a classroom, but that only is good as long as it serves some end, which is what the education is for in the end, right? Which is probably something like participating in society or um, of serving the common good. And so ultimately, you end up at this uh, overarching common good of all of, of humankind or all of society. And everything needs to aim at that. It needs to be alignment for Aristotle. And, and Dominic Millet is drawing on that for saying, well, if we're a community, if our community has a purpose, it has to be the overarching good of the community members, not something else. Let's kind of skip ahead a few pages to 97 where there's a decent summary of this. I've got my offline copy here where I know. Um, 
yeah, here we go. This, this first section right here. So uh, I'll, I think it's easier to read it if I, if I don't highlight it, but take a second and read through that paragraph and then think about some of the implications because that's really the heart of his argument. I zoom back and I can also see the sentence on the other side about how he would apply this to businesses. So there we go, right? Um, if we have to respect the humanities of others and recognize their dignity and recognize their rights, well then leadership and he's thinking about this in a business organization at that point needs to be directed toward those things and you can't here's where the criticism comes in right? we started with all the other theories are based on individual interests being satisfied you have to subordinate individual interests to the common good and that goes against a lot right Sorry, Michael, what did you, maybe all are, yeah, agreed. Um, I'm not sure we need to let this go easily. You know, certainly there's a lot to uh, if we go back and read some of the early chapters in Adam Smith, if we think about our early basic microeconomics classes, um, there's some intuitive things about imagining economic actors pursuing their own interests or greed, if we want to use the sort of pejorative term that explain what's happening in society and economics. Uh, anybody want to stand up for individual interests? It's <laughs> I certainly don't want us to just read everything that's published in a journal and believe that it's automatically perfect. Uh, and I'm just wondering if this is not a channeling of, of uh, Wojtyla in the Catholic social thought that that is just the the notion of participation and the 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 balance that I think every somewhat capable thinker was making that there is a trade-off in some way between protecting the individual and advancing the community and I think you've seen this across all kinds of spiritual traditions denominations um, and and E.O. Wilson is making the same argument through the biological lens and, and evolutionary lens. And so you, you can see this is actually something widely accepted. It's not outstanding. And I'm, I'm not sure if, if anybody can disagree with this. <laughs> it is more like a, a wisdom insight that you can get to and embrace or not. Fair, yeah. Okay, thank you, Michael. That's a good elaboration. So... Um, let me look at my last couple questions. Um, I, I see David's question here. How does this relate to your own research? Um, that is kind of where I'd like to end up. Uh, another question that, if that one's not easy to answer, might be, um, do we see out there in the world organizations that do operate this way? And um, do they inform us about how this might work for more organizations uh, than currently embrace it? So anybody want to uh, suggest one of those options, right? An example of an organization that behaves this way that you've seen or how you might be looking for something like this 
in your work academically or in practice. We may have practitioners on the call. I don't know. Are you coming in, David? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know that I have any comment about what's kind of coming in, but I wanted to back up a, just a second. Um, because we, well, I kind of build this continuum of kind of, um, you know, purely economic interest transaction contract, and then start building towards the stakeholder, which we say, yes, we're going to start bringing more and more people in. And so I just wanted to kind of throw out for the group and kind of ask where the, you know, the idea of CSR comes in, because we still, um, and, and as we start thinking about this, we're talking about community, but we're still talking about in terms of human community, and, and there's a lot to be taken into account beyond that. Uh, but so my question was, you know, where do we think CSR stands? Because it's still, it's still talked about so much in terms of transactional terms. What's the return on investment and those kinds of things versus the longer kind of, you know, um, cosmological view of what, you know, what are we all here for and what, how, does, how, are things, how are all things connected? And so I think, so that's where I'm, you know, I'm kind of seeing this, this build up in terms of community and, and kind of, and then beyond this even. So, um, so I guess my question is more around the CSR and kind of where you, where, where, which side of the fence you see that in kind of the transactional or uh, economic <laughs> even larger numbers of uh, people participating um, and boy and then on the other side was more voice and more representation did that make sense okay i'll come off me now um yeah excellent question david uh, thank you for that and i see michael is adding a few comments on this um, and David Wasadusky as well. Is anybody studying corporate social responsibility? Oh, not Celeste. Uh, we'll come to your question in just a second, Celeste. That's great. Um, yeah, okay. So I think uh, to David Greenway's point, uh, Dominic here is actually sort of distinguishing corporate social responsibility from what he's trying to build. He wants to argue that uh, ethics and the common good is intrinsic, is essential to the idea of the business. Whereas right. in his perspective, at least, the concept of corporate social responsibility is a voluntaristic choice that, that a corporation may adopt sort of as a choosing to be part of society rather than being society. Right. Okay, I agree. So the, yep. the, that would be an attempt to differentiate. I'm not sure everyone in the corporate social responsibility space would agree that it's voluntaristic. They might want to argue it's, it's required. But, but yeah. well. All right. Um, so Celeste, I'm looking at your question here. Do you want to come on audio and, and make it the group? You may be. Okay, so I'm, I'm unmuted here. Yeah. Um, so Michael, Michael actually kind of responded back saying, you know, these, these different theoretical lenses aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, and, and I guess I'm, where I'd, you know, I'm, I'm reading this article and, and I think, okay, I don't see anything wrong with, with um, you know, this perspective of being a community of persons. Um, and I'm just trying to, to see, okay, how do I integrate this with the existing, uh, you know, sort of theoretical schools of thought that we're using already? And, and perhaps, I, maybe I should kind of, uh, um, I happen to be in a, you know, in a department and working with people who uh, don't necessarily take an economistic uh, view of the firm, um, uh, at least personally, <laughs> but, uh, you know, even if they're the work that, that, you know, the scholarly work that they do kind of tends to, tends to look at only those aspects. Um, but I'm just, I'm, I guess I'm thinking, all right, so what Dominic has written here makes a lot of sense. Um, so how, how can I integrate that with, with other theoretical schools of thought? Yeah, 
Oh, that's a great question. What is one of those schools that you're working with now? Um, so I've done, done a little bit with kind of population ecology or evolutionary theory, just kind of looking at Howard Aldrich's work on entrepreneurship. Um, and, uh, and then a little bit of uh, institutional theory and now starting to kind of get into critical discourse. Uh, so right, <laughs> right now you could say I'm a mile wide and an inch deep. I haven't quite got yet to the inch wide, mile deep <laughs> part, of my, part of my program yet. <laughs> wow. It's, I think all of us will probably say that for a while. Um, yeah, anybody want to jump in on one of those? I think that's great. How would we relate something like this to institutional theory, population ecology, or uh, critical um, management studies, right? E any of those are areas that, that we would want to connect in with, with these ideas. Um, if I may come in just sort of briefly, I think many of those theories were developed within the economistic sort of paradigm that overlays it. That doesn't mean that those frameworks couldn't be used for others. Um, so institutional theory and the actor, how do they act? What is the question? What are they trying to achieve? What is it that you call performativity, et cetera? What are those things? Um, and you can ask the same thing with ecolo ecological and uh, uh, e what is evolutionary sort of frameworks. What is the outcome that you're looking at? Is it well-being or is it profit? That's the kind of thing. Are you aware or attuned towards the notion or the possibility that there is a dignity piece to it, a threshold? Uh, that it's not just like a, a functional continuum of some sort uh, in which you squeeze people or not. <laughs> um, are you attuned to these questions? And I think then all these frameworks can help you understand it better. Because um, in the end, it's about people. And if you have a different perspective on people and what people desire, and if they desire a community of persons as well, then you'll probably understand why they do irrational things, quote unquote, right? why they do mingle, why they hang out, why they are unproductive, and why that is helpful to them. And if you don't have that framework, then you sort of look at the rationality piece of it and what is the productivity piece and all the things that are more legitimate in the current uh, literature. Now, the beauty of it is if you have that framework, Celeste, the, the more traditional one, and you give it that overlay of the, of the paradigm, the, the humanistic paradigm, you can actually compare and contrast and see novel things. And then you can use something like the background that uh, Dominic provides here to inform why certain things are happening as outcomes of human interaction, human connection, human relationships. And, and that may give you a better way of accessing some of the current theoretical frames. That's a long winded answer, but I think it's just like, these are definitely not mutually exclusive, but they have been, most of those uh, methods and frames have been used within an economistic understanding of people and the firm. That doesn't mean they can't be used for other understandings. And if you're, um, so, so I think the, the field has, has, and I could be mistaken, of course, because of the environment that I'm in and, and what the norms are here, but um, in general, I think that, that most of us have moved away from the idea that humans are rational beings and so the kind of behavioral you know behave we we all kind of look at at humans with bounded rationality and and um uh so may, maybe uh, perhaps perhaps what i'm looking for here and i'm, I'm sort of stumbling around because I'm trying to identify if like a, a particular statement or um, that would say if, if um, given, you know, given human beings as non-rational uh, and then institutional theory would say this about why organizations form or why uh, you know organizations choose to work, work together or 
people work together, et cetera. Because et cetera. people are social, they form social communities and we now call them whatever, administrations or, or firms. But that's, that's the underlying notion of, of this perspective, right? We are fundamentally social. And that's why we create these social vehicles, whatever they may be, families, uh, groups of groups, teams, any kind of fan club, sports club, and then firms. So that's just the foundational difference in terms of it's totally an irrational decision also. In many ways, those things exist just to be together. Uh, fan clubs, for example, right? I mean, there's nothing <laughs> rational about that. Um, and so I think it just shifts the lens. It doesn't mean that the framework of institutional theory cannot be helpful in explaining why certain uh, dimensions or actions are more likely to occur in this framework than in another framework or how an institutional entrepreneur can shift those frames, et cetera, et cetera. Can I just add as well, and I feel really like I owe Benedetta an apology note for continually not getting to her article, but... Um, the Jimmy Kimmel oh, and uh, what is the other guy? Her core claim in this other article we were, we were going to consider today is that um, the model, the sort of theoretical model of the human being in these theories can be much richer. So similar to the criticisms in Dominic Mele, it's not just about interests. Uh, she draws on Sen and Nussbaum's idea of uh, capabilities and she, she's arguing really for um, these kind of dual ideas of uh, capabilities, meaning that you might do something or you might need something to give you capability A, but capability B is, is not substitutable for capability A. And both of those capabilities or the whole constellation of human capabilities, like knowing your parents or having an education or being able to read or participating in economic activity, all of those dimensions of what it means to be a human being are, are part of what it means to pursue the good of a human being, not just a dollar a day or $2 a day or $3 a day, right? So trying to expand it out that way. And Benedetta's other element of it is this idea of human richness. And she's saying kind of what Michael was saying about irrationality, that human beings are complex and they are pursuing multiple ends all the time, multiple goals, multiple desires, and switching between those desires in ways that are not reducible down to something as simple as um, pursuing their one individual utility curve or interest. So that's not fair to her article, but that's my best to summarize it. And I think Celeste's question was the right moment to try to summarize it for us today. Um, if anybody read Benedetta's article, and we have maybe two minutes to comment or question on it as well. And then uh, I do wanna end early so we can kind of do feedback and talk about next time. Any other comments on the 2009 article? Yes, Michael. Well, I just want to sort of share with folks that may not be sort of uh, so familiar with all of that, that uh, Nussbaum and Sen were taking up the humanistic quote unquote perspective in economics for a long time with some of the other uh, folks that they're citing. And there is within economics already is an established and more recognized stream that we could call ec humanistic economics that is going back to the Aristotelian kind of framing that <clears throat> in a sense has been missing for a long time in management and business uh, in, in those disciplines and Peter Brown would call it because, or say it, because it is basically a, an orphan discipline, especially in the Anglo-Saxon uh, context. I don't know how it is at site. There is almost no economics taught in business schools. Mm. So people don't know where it's coming from. And, and so we're battling, we're battling against ghosts in some way uh, and uh, drawing on what Benedetta is proposing here, a different perspective on human nature that also already was part of a very established conversation economics can give you legitimacy if you feel that is useful. And then all the other frames that you can use in your traditional approaches in org theory or something can be informed through a different lens as well. Mm. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. 
Right. Well, we were trying to end these um, on time and we tried to ask for feedback at the end. Um, David, did you want to, I guess it's just a general, um, how do you guys um, build the needs as PhD students and what would you like to cover if you were to come to another one of these in the future? How would it look? What would it be? And yeah, these are, the, these are the questions I have in mind here for the last couple of minutes, um, really inviting people to speak up. Uh, certainly you can email Tyson or me uh, with any topics you might be interested in, but we, uh, we didn't finish this conversation the last time, so that's why we built on this this time, based on any feedback that this might be an interesting uh, set of articles to, to delve deeper into. Yeah. But uh, is there, are there certain topics that uh, you think would be very interesting to you for future months, because we'd like to do this uh, each month? have a real intimate conversation about the work. Um, if I may, yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, it would be really interesting if we could um, focus on some international approaches. Like, you know, something like, I mean, of course, generally, like, getting into the subject is great, like talking about Nussbaum and Zen, but I would love to know also, like, in case you have some experience in that field, um, some Asian perspective or some perspective which you usually isn't really acknowledged in the discourse. Just like if we talk about virtues and um, and different values and different approaches, <laughs> I would love to have it like on an international level if possible. Okay, international and more what I'm hearing is a little bit more applied. So you want to see it in a, uh, op like Celeste was asking, in another Con theory or context. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be brilliant. Okay, great. Yeah, I've noted those. And Victoria, what were you referring to regarding virtue? Oh, generally, I don't know. I so far I've only like I've just started reading about it. Like just you know, like we often talk about like Asian virtues, which is like very like a general term, and like you draw a division between like culture so it's like also you can you know look at it critically but like generally just like I don't know different approaches to how uh, what the human nature is or like how you should like apply like or structure a system of of communication like in a firm you know, so, okay. this isn't the first time that uh certain virtues have come up. So that might be a very good topic for us to pursue. And I know a couple of people that didn't make the call had suggested it too. So that might get them on board next time. So sure, we can take a more applied look at that Brilliant. in one of the future sessions. Thank you. Yeah. And just a general question before we go, um, is this format working for you? I, I don't know what the best way this works for you is is it uh, do you just want to absorb and, and listen like this is a talk or how could we make this more interactive where you would uh, I'll be willing to offer your opinion on these is the is the homework the, the pre-work for these sessions is it uh, is it manageable um, for me yes definitely um, I I, I'd love to have actually the questions beforehand. I think that would be great. So it wouldn't be just like spontaneous, but like I would kind of, you know, just kind of have like a more time to, to contemplate about it. Okay. And Celeste is putting things in the chat. I'm going to save the chat too, and we can circulate this. And I've recorded this session too, so we'll post it on our email website. Yeah, those are great suggestions, Celeste. Yeah, thank you. Celeste and Victoria. And if anything comes to any of your minds in the meantime, please feel free to email Tyson or me or Michael and uh, would be more than happy to uh, consider that for other, this is for you. So we, we wanna get the topics and discussions going that benefit you the most. Uh, Michael says the positive organizational scholarship perspective as well. I think I, I've heard that too. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, in the interest of time to keep this to what we suggested, uh, I want to thank Tyson and, and to all of you. Thank you, Michael, too, for supporting EMA for making this all possible, really.
but uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. We have a PhD network on April 1st, and I will be sending out the event bright uh, probably tomorrow morning. And uh, then we will have our next reading group next month on the second Monday. So thank you all. Tyson, if you want to say a closing word, I, I really appreciate you all being here. Thanks. Oh, um, I would say the same. Thanks, everyone. Uh, great to see some new faces. Great to have all your contributions. And again, um, we're all making this start to happen because there's kind of a sense that it's needed, but we're going to find it together. So come back. Thank you all. Thank you all. Take care. David, you have five minutes? No. I can uh, get on in the car, but I have to run into school to teach. Okay. I need a few minutes. Right. Okay. Okay. See you guys. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Tyson. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I won't. <laughs> Last time we all hung up and we all tried to get back on and that uh, was a disaster. <laughs> in that line. Okay. But I think Tyson, you have the power now. You're the host. I'm the host? Yeah. Oh, okay. What does that make me able to do? I think if David and Yuan Yan, they can, they can listen into our conversation. Victoria, you want to listen? You want to yeah. share? Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't mind people listening in at all. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. Victoria, you're definitely um, engaged. If you have comments, um, please share them as well. So. We're trying to do debrief, Victoria. Maybe you can share what, what, what is your take and what is maybe your desire or wish to, to sort of see happening beyond the, the content uh, shift that you suggested. Oh, dear. <clears throat> um, so far, I just think it's really, really great to, you know, have to have a group of people and, you, you know, you continue to meet up every month. So probably then there. Also, you know, will be like new issues coming up or like certain questions being posed, which you can just kind of like look on on a long term, you know, not just kind of like just kind of see how they evolve and like certain questions where where it becomes more specific. I don't know. I I really appreciate like I really enjoy the session. Good. That's great. Was it? Where, where like, are you based? Can I ask? I'm sorry. Where are you based? Oh, tuning in. Uh, so you're working with Klaus and you're working with the, the group uh, at uh, Veldetos or? I took courses there. Okay. So like, I'm not a PhD student, but I'm familiar with the, with the staff. Oh, wow. So you want to be a PhD student or? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, <laughs> um, probably, probably in the long run, yes. But I, wow. I so far, I just kind of like to narrow down the field of, of, of research. So it's more just kind of okay. like HR development coming from background of philosophy and business as a minor. So um, I don't know. Um, I find it just really interesting the you know, the part where, where like theory meets, you know, actual, actual um, implementation. So you have courses being taught, you know, people being aware of different cultures, but then it still comes to a cultural clash when it comes to certain um, way of handling situations. Let's say, for example, a German company going to China and then you have like this um, certain behavioral structures and they aren't acknowledged or they, they don't try to try to learn from them, but they're just kind of like diminished in the value because they presume Western culture is more evolved, like more, um, like, you know, on a hierarchical structure, like in a certain way, more advanced. So, um, yes, I'm very much interested in, in the way of, you know, just kind of like the conjuncture of different perspectives of human nature, of virtues, values, those kind of, kind of areas. 
Good, good. Are you at work uh, at this point? Are you working uh, for a company or are you at the university? No, I'm at the university. Oh, okay. All right. Wow. You're dedicated. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what are your fields? Like, what, what are you working on? I'm working on humanistic management. So that's, <laughs> that's my field. <laughs> so, um, and that's why I enjoy this kind of stuff, of course. Uh, and I'm very grateful for you guys to to be part of it. So. Like you probably you probably participated when Christian Felber had his talk about the common good. Yeah, yeah, I organized it with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like, do you, how do you pursue? Do you pursue that like um, initiative? Well, Christian and I are working together in a way because uh, this is the International Humanistic Management Association that I represent, and so in that sense, we're we're working to to find ways to do research together. He's doing a lot of things in a in a more applied field, but he uses our work, Klaus's work, and my work in some way to to give legitimacy to his um, his uh, uh, yeah actions and because we are sort of more global and we are working also with other kind of groups, we're sort of exploring how we're doing more research together. And one of the things Tyson, I'm, and I, I uh, nominated you for a fellowship. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. That would be uh, that, uh, that we then use the data that Christian and others are sort of gathering through their activities to understand how uh, we can identify certain approaches, practices, uh, that seem to work along what you're saying right now in terms of building community of persons. That's that's exactly that's the economy for the common good. They use the term dignity. Is same. This is all the stuff that we've been talking about. This is all the stuff, and they're sort of putting it into the applied form of this balance sheet. So um, that's one way to get the conversation going there, which has been quite successful. We're sort of looking at it through the the academic discourse um, with the long run game, and I just wanted to share Tyson also with you. Um, the Jesuit network, they have 150 universities globally. They tapped me to be helping them with transforming business education along those lines. So that's sort of picking up steam quite, quite quickly. We just need to figure out how to organize it. Um, wow. But okay. um, <clears throat> so I'm just sharing with you because that's sort of where now the San Nussbaum frame can help uh, connect with the Catholic frame and then with a global uh, frame of the United Nations, the SDGs network and Jeff Sachs, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he mm -hmm. now also sort of sees the Jesuit as sort of some of the players that can set the stage in a new discourse on economics education. And so um, I'm working with him and with uh, his deputies, quote unquote, and folks at the Vatican um, that, that want to make that more a focused project. So all of these things in a small group or the big group, but there's a lot of need for it on all fronts, it seems. And it's, uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. And that's where Christian is also interested in, in helping and, and others. Huh. Makes sense. So when you say the Jesuits, is that like somehow Boston college is going to change its business school because it's a Jesuit school and they've signed on for this, or is it like, new things supported by the, the Jesuit order. So I'm at Fordham, which is a Jesuit university, and my dean, she officially said she will lead this uh, or fund it or support mm -hmm. the, the, the outreach. Georgetown and Nesade are the one, uh, the two or three schools that have already signed on, quote unquote, informally. Uh, Nesade more so than Georgetown. But I think from what I see is that, that they want, the Jesuit superior is with us at Fordham. So he would like to have certain institutions be globally representing sort of Indian Jesuit universities, then uh, Latin American ones and African institutions, I believe. And so they form the core group and then there will be sort of a wave approach in terms of reforming the core core courses and aligning them with uh, integral human development or what we just talked about here, the, this perspective uh, of Mele and uh, Joanola. And uh, yeah. That's great. So, but that's a side note, but B Victoria, you mentioned Christian and so that's sort of somehow how we're working with him. 
But part of it is, of course, that the PhD students of the next generation are able to teach this because that's the problem. It's like we're we're uh, teaching and training most of the people right now with the old framework. So they they can't the best that they can do is CSR and maybe a business ethics conversation at some point or maybe an institute like the World Ethos Institute uh, outside. <laughs> that's sort of like something. But then the core of it is all traditionalist stuff. Right. So, well, hi, David. I think this 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 effort here is very critical. Even though it may start small, it's very critical in terms of like, okay, how can we build the capacity within a generation that actually needs to be in there now? Um, right. Right. I mean, I think in terms of like what we're trying to do with this, I think Celeste's question really also uh, got to the heart of it in terms of how do we take you know, these are all and you know maybe we misnamed the group uh, foundational concepts but people are kind of working right mm -hmm. celeste is working in institutional theory or whatever um i think it's hard to make that translation into and to even to see like is my theory is what i'm working with um what are its philosophical foundations? Mm -hmm. Is it already kind of informed by these principles or is it based on, on economistic assumptions that we've all forgotten about? Because, I mean, as you were saying, people don't really disagree with the principle, mm -hmm. but we all work with theories that don't incorporate it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I'm trying to think, well, I think about how we do that. I mean, I think this is fantastic work because that's where people need to go because they go into a PhD program and then they're sort of just, here's the framework, get uh, read all about this field or that field and find your field and then you stick to that and that's it. And then there's almost never a philosophical reflection on what is the foundation of this field and why did this theory develop to begin with? And then at the end or mid-career, you're sort of in this crisis, like, oh my God, I never really understood why I'm doing this and why I'm sort of so empty in, in terms of my, my approach to research and understanding is so, so soulless. And, and you've seen, uh, countless uh, conversations with, with mid-career people like myself right now, where it's like, oh my God, yeah. It's like, well, you never had the opportunity to really reflect more deeply on what the foundation of this is. And you force yourself to become a scholar because some of this is glorious or something. And then, and then all of it is sort of technical, hmm. not human. And, um, and I have to leave this call in about a minute because I have another <laughs> interesting okay. conversation going on with, with a number of people. We're, we're building new programs right now at Fordham also, where some of these are foundations of it, right? And, and where these ontological questions are the key, uh, key questions to start with. Like, who are we as human beings and what, do we, what does it mean to flourish? Um, and, and this is sort of so far out of uh, the current uh, uh, business talk, the MBA talk and all that. So it requires completely new innovative approaches to it and not that we know what it is but um but i think this is what this is too and i i commend you ties and i think bring up those articles and and yes there may be more business ethics oriented uh but at least it gives some flavor to it and maybe the next one will be uh, more philosophical and then one more applied one and seeing how those connections work and which theories institutional theory seems to be a very popular one so maybe one could be connected with that. And the question is, what would it mean to look at institutional theory through a humanistic lens? Um, and, and what kind of insights might you, or questions might you ask that way? Uh, yeah, I like that idea. Okay, I'm gonna let you go to your call, Michael. Thank you. Uh,